What happens if you take evolution simulation video game The Sapling, design a planet, design a basic alga and a really simple aquatic animal and then turn on random mutations for millions of in-game years? How will life evolve? That is what this YouTube series called Evolution Simulated is about. So first things first, the planet. One of the many new things added in the latest update, called the food and fire update, are seeds that float. And also aquatic seeds. So let's create a planet with a lot of water. Oh, and let's throw in a ring too, which is another new feature. It generates a shadow around the equator, making the center of the map a bit colder. Hmm, now there's snow, that's a bit too much, but this is perfect. Then for the light reaching the soil, I want to make blue light unstable, so all algae and plants will have to reflect blue light, giving the plants in particular a blue purplish color. Okay, let's take the default alga and put it here, exactly in the center of the map. A thousand years later, the first mother species is thriving, but we also see that three branches have split off. One specializing in shallow water, one specializing in deep water, and one that has lost its hold fast completely. These algae passively drift on the water surface, coloring the oceans green. By this time, the algae have colonized less than a third of the ocean, which is unusually slow. This is because the islands create small passageways, making it hard for evolutionary innovations to spread. For example, the algae here have specialized for deep oceans with strong currents. This innovation is needed here too, but the algae here are specialized for shallow water and weak currents and will have to evolve the necessary traits independently. Okay, time for the first animal. Let's go with a green sea snake thing. Because it only has a small tail fin to propel itself forward, it is a slow and unstable swimmer, so it will only survive in shallow water with weak currents. Fortunately, by this time there are plenty of edible algae here, a somewhat larger area that meets this criterion, forming an expansive nursery perfectly suited for animal life. The borders of this nursery are clear though. Venture too far north and our newfound creatures will not be able to handle the colder water temperature beneath the planet's rings. Stray too far in any other direction and they'll battle against the relentless pool of the ocean currents. For those that stay within their habitat though, the absence of competition means that most have access to so much food that they can reproduce two or three times throughout their lifetime, leading to explosive growth. A thousand years later, various species have split off. The two most populous ones owe their success to innovations in their mouths. These mouths allow them to eat the algae more efficiently. One has additional external mouth parts, the other has evolved a sophisticated jaw structure. They have also developed a stronger tail, but this doesn't increase the size of their habitat enough to make a real difference. In fact, we have now reached the maximum amount of animals this area can support. To overcome this limitation and explore new territories, these creatures must evolve different bodies. However, due to the relatively small population size, opportunities for stumbling upon the necessary innovations are scarce. This causes a negative feedback loop in which the animals will be trapped for thousands of years. They remain confined to their birthplace because they don't evolve the necessary body parts to leave, but they don't evolve because they cannot leave their birthplace. This evolutionary slowdown, caused by the presence of so many islands, in many ways mirrors the slowdown of the algae a few thousand years ago. The algae now benefit from it though, because they can now grow almost anywhere undisturbed. Finally, it is this species that manages to break free from the cycle, mainly because of its back fin and larger body size. A natural consequence of this is that all animals that are not living in the original strata location are descendants of this one species that made it through the bottleneck and in these early years this is clearly visible with the naked eye because all animals living in the deeper oceans are large, blue and striped. The larger speed of this species also enables it to traverse the cold equatorial zone before freezing to death, making it the first species to reach the northern oceans. With their habitat suddenly doubled in size, the species experiences a dramatic rise in population size, becoming the most populous species on this planet thus far. 
With their sheer numbers, they also managed to outcompete the original sea snake family in their confined shallow water habitat, leaving only one fortunate member of the original family. Most of the animals we have seen so far were either herbivores, specializing for the algae that are so abundant everywhere, or omnivores, which in practice also almost exclusively ate these same algae. About a thousand years after the animals reached the Northern Ocean, we witnessed the first signs of change. For species living in the more crowded areas, the dead causes eggs eaten or just eaten start appearing as frequent reasons of death. All animals are about the same size, and animals of the same size cannot eat each other, but they can eat each other's young. But again, these are omnivores, and the meat only forms a small part of their diet. There is one exception though, which is this species. It has sharper teeth and, according to its statistics, is mostly relying on a carnivore diet. A few thousand years later, we see another more specialized animal emerge. Filter feeders, specializing for the floating microalgae. These algae are somewhat uncommon in this world though, so this animal too will not shy away from sucking in a little baby every now and then. Nevertheless, the number of filter feeder individuals will remain low. They survive, but always on the brink of extinction. The threat posed by meat eaters accelerates the development of instincts. While there were already a few instincts here and there, a lot of creatures inherited eyes from their ancestors without fully using them. These times are now over. We see the fundamental instinct if you see food go towards it in all animal families. But there's more, like the more aggressive if you feel pain attack, aimed at hurting predators, or if you feel too cold, go away from it. This latter one is common among species living near the shadow of the rings, which still often freeze to death because the water is so much colder there. This species finally manages to combine these instincts with the most powerful eyes and fins we've seen to date, making it extremely successful. It's particularly prominent in this region of the map, but you can encounter it truly anywhere. In every new aquatic biome it enters, it manages to outcompete and replace most of the species that were there previously, dramatically decreasing the biodiversity on this planet, and things will stay this way for quite a while. After 23 millennia, we finally see change, and it starts at this purple alga species. One of its descendants figures out how to survive out of the water, leading to the very first land plants taking root on the center island. Almost immediately a more grass-like body shape develops, covering most of the island. In subsequent years various sea types come and go again, but they all have one trait in common. They all fall straight down and are not moved by the wind. This is a hallmark characteristic of island plants in this game, because seeds with parachute-like structures have a much larger risk to be blown into the water and die, they are an evolutionary disadvantage on this planet. But even more important than seed quality is seed quantity. To be able to grow more seeds, you need more energy, and for more energy, you need more leaves. For more leaves, in turn, you need more space. So the plants on this center island grow taller. But besides winning that race for the sky, another way to survive is to not compete at all. A thousand years later, we discover a small species that has become fully aquatic, like its ancestor algae. Its seeds are specialized not to die in water, but to sink to the bottom and germinate instead. On an island, water is never far away, so we can expect that many families will have one or more aquatic plants. And while the land plants move back into aquatic territory, aquatic animals visit the land more and more often. At first glance, you may think nothing is going on here, but you only have to look down in the tall grass. By sheer coincidence, this species already had fins robust enough to drag itself onto land for thousands of years but only now there is grass to graze upon, it actually does so. These animals reproduce when they have collected enough energy, and with the enormous food supply now available on land, this often happens on the shore, immediately providing a first meal for the newborns. They remain dependent on water for their oxygen though, 
so sooner or later they will need to return. How will these creatures evolve and how will the plants on the various islands grow apart? That we will see in the next episode of Evolution Simulated. Hope to see you there. Okay, by the way, I want to mention two new features for the game. Firstly, if you own this game on Steam or Itch, you can now make videos like this one by yourself, with the new cinematic camera tools that are now available to everyone. Secondly, players also mentioned the game runs considerably better than a year ago, which is good, but the performance issues are still not fully solved. As a workaround, you can now also use organism caps. Okay, bye.